Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. Anyone who's been watching my show for any amount of time knows that I love to speak about the Holy Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith, God in the flesh, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord, there on Catholic high altars everywhere all over the world. And yet, a massive number of Catholics do not believe in the real presence, something like 75%, probably a higher number now. And why is that? Why is there so much loss of belief in the Holy Eucharist today? Well, is it really a surprise? The flock follows its shepherds. And when our own shepherds refuse to treat the Holy Eucharist with due reverence and love, when our own shepherds, not all of them, but many of them, demonstrate a wholesale loss of belief in the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, in the way that they treat our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, well, the flock's going to follow. I'm going to get into all of that tonight because I'm going to talk about proofs of the Holy Eucharist that it truly is God in the flesh through miracles, scientifically examined miracles over the course of the centuries. Absolutely fascinating topic that you do not want to miss out on, especially those out there who may be doubting their faith, who may be doubting the reality of God in the flesh and the Holy Eucharist, or for non-Catholics who don't understand the concept and don't believe it. Trust me, you're going to want to stick around. But first, I encourage all men out there to come to our Strength and Honor Men's Retreat. It's August 4th through 6th, and it's a time to get a spiritual boost as men specifically. This is geared towards men. I'm going to read just a little snippet from the Men's Retreat website, Strength and Honor. The very identity with which God created you, manhood, masculinity, is under severe assault. And men need to come together and remember not only whose image and likeness we are created in, but also the specific form taken on by the incarnate eternal logos, a man. And you're with other like-minded men, and you're there to help each other, strengthen each other, encourage one another in the faith. This year, the hosts, the speakers will be Michael Voris, Simon Rafe and Jesse Romero. And Jesse Romero, actually, I'm going to be airing an interview that I did with Jesse, you know, on on this this set. And it's absolutely fascinating. A lot of people don't know that he was actually a deputy sheriff in Los Angeles, California for 20 years before he ever embarked on, you know, his current career of just Catholic evangelization and writing and speaking. And let me tell you, he had some incredible encounters as an LA cop. I mean, just unbelievable. So you are going to to want to watch that show because it's it's a fascinating show. I received a comment under one of my recent episodes where an individual was doubting the reality of the Holy Eucharist. And this was his comment. We're just going to call him Chris B. It's very hard for me to see the Holy Communion as the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. I am Catholic for 52 years also in several monasteries. Now, when I first read that, I thought, wow, really? Catholic for 52 years, also spent time in monasteries, I'm assuming discerning a vocation in monasteries, and still not believing, doubting the reality of of our Lord and the Holy Eucharist. First, it is basic dogma. It must be believed in order to be Catholic. I mean, you, you have to believe it. If you're having doubts, Okay, that's understandable. Everyone, everyone struggles with doubts, but it is something that must be believed by faith. It's not something that can be grasped with reason. But sometimes God gives us tremendous helps and proofs along the way for those who are doubting. For instance, perhaps the most famous Eucharistic miracle in history is the miracle of Lanciano in Italy. This took place in the year 750 in the Italian city of Frentanese at the Church of St. Legantian. The particular priest there at the time was having terrible doubts about the real presence, whether or not, is this truly, does this truly transubstantiate into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord? Does God really come down from heaven onto the high altar when I speak the words of consecration? Because remember, priests are marked They are ontologically marked forever when they receive holy orders. 
such that they are given the power to confect the Holy Eucharist, which truly transforms from mere bread and wine to the real flesh and blood of our Lord, whom we receive in Holy Communion in the most intimate union possible this side of heaven. You talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it doesn't get more personal than that. It simply does not. And it is something I wish so much for those outside the faith to know, to experience, because there is nothing on earth like it, and it is real. It is 110% real. Now, in this case, as the priest is speaking the words of consecration, still suffering with terrible doubts, the bread turns into actual living flesh right before his eyes. The wine turns into blood right before his eyes. And how do we know this? That flesh and that blood have been preserved for 12 centuries. They've been preserved. That in itself is a complete and total unexplained miracle. There is no scientific explanation for how the blood and the flesh are preserved for 12 centuries. Much of that time when it was exposed to the, to the elements. In 1970, the Archbishop of Lanciano commissioned a scientific study and he called on some of the brightest minds to examine this unexplained phenomenon. Professor Eduardo Linoli, director of the hospital at Arezzo and also professor of anatomy and pathological histology, chemistry, and clinical microscopy, was the one who led the investigation, helped by Professor Ruggiero Bertelli of the University of Siena. They subjected this to rigorous scientific examination, and these were their findings. The flesh is actual human flesh. The blood is actual human blood. It's living, and it is fresh. Living. It's living flesh and it's living blood. Both species reacted to stimuli in exactly the same way that regular living human flesh and blood would react to the same stimuli. Unexplained. The flesh consists of muscular tissue. And guess where the muscular tissue comes from specifically? Which part of the body? It's not the leg. It's not the arm. It's not the face. It's not the toe. It's not not the stomach, it's the heart. The flesh is from the heart. The myocardium, the endocardium, the vagus nerve, and the left ventricle of the heart are there. They comprise this living flesh. So the flesh is a heart in all of its essential aspects. Now, this is profound because anybody who knows the Catholic faith and Catholic devotion knows that perhaps the most famous Catholic devotion, Christological Catholic devotion in the world is the sacred heart of Jesus. Why is it that Christ of all organs and parts of his body would choose his heart as the representation of his love? Because as we know, the sacred heart is often shown encircled by fire or on flames. And this is how his heart appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in France. And he appeared to her with his heart completely aflame and on fire. And that was supposed to represent his intense and burning love for mankind. Burning, burning love. All-consuming love for mankind, for each of us. And that's what his heart represents, his love, his intense, burning, all-consuming love for each of us. And so it makes sense. It makes sense that this host, which turned into living flesh, and it's still living flesh to this very day, would be flesh tissue from his heart. It's an amazing, it's a beautiful, that you contemplate it for hours. It's amazing. It's amazing the love that God has for us and how he's manifesting that in this proof, this miraculous proof of his love. Now the flesh and blood have the same blood type, type AB, which exactly matches 
the blood found on the Shroud of Turin. In the blood, there were found proteins in the same normal proportions that you'd expect in human blood, percentage-wise. In the blood are also found minerals, chlorides, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and calcium. The preservation, like I said, of the flesh and blood left for more than 12 centuries, and yet still living, still fresh, is absolutely unexplained. We'll be right back with the show, but I'd like to take a moment to encourage you to sign up for a premium subscription if you haven't already. It's only $10 a month, which is a really rock bottom price, and it gets you thousands of hours of content on everything across the board, theology, philosophy, apologetics, history, everything. We have things for little children. We have things for adults. While we give a lot of our content away for free, the work that we do here does not come for free. It costs us money. The $10 a month will go a long way in helping us to continue to produce top quality faith-based content, all with a view towards spreading truth, ultimately for the salvation of souls. So if you want to support us, please consider signing up for premium at churchmilitant.com forward slash go premium. That's churchmilitant.com forward slash go premium. Thank you so much for your support. Let's move to more recent miracles, miracles that have happened in the 2000s and have been subjected to rigorous scientific examination. Now, there are more than 100 documented Eucharistic miracles, but as far as I'm aware, these are the only ones that have been subjected to rigorous scientific scrutiny. So let's go through a few recent ones. There was one in 2006 in Tizla, Mexico. During a retreat, a religious sister who was distributing Holy Communion Uh, looked down and she saw that one of the hosts had begun to bleed and transform into flesh. That host was taken and preserved. 2008, Sokolka, Poland, a consecrated host fell to the ground during Holy Communion. Now, protocol is whenever this sort of thing happens, you very reverently, the priest very reverently takes the sacred host, places the sacred host in water, and then locks it away in the tabernacle until the host breaks down naturally. It goes through the natural decomposition process because at that point, then our Lord is no longer present. It's still holy. You still treat it, you know, with reverence, but our Lord is no longer present. And at that point, you're able to take uh, the remains and pour them down the sacrarium, which is a special drain that, that drains right down into the earth. That's because you don't want to be pouring these holy contents into the sewer, which is where the sink water goes. You, so there's a special drain called the sacrarium that takes it down straight into the earth. When, you know, they came back a week later to take a look at the, the host, expecting it to have been completely decomposed. Instead, they found a red blood clot in the place of the host. Similar happening in 2013 in Lignitsa, Poland. Consecrated host fell to the ground. Uh, the host was placed in water, locked in the tabernacle. This time it was two weeks later, they came back. took it out, and they saw the host was not dissolved, totally undissolved, and there was a large red spot that covered one-fifth of the host. Now, each of these hosts, blood clots, um, were sent to scientific lab. And what's interesting is some of these scientists were not told of the origins of, of this tissue. They were simply told, look at this and tell us what this is. And so that's exactly what they did. Here, here are the findings. Once again, blood is human blood, they confirmed, and it's type AB, exactly as the type found at the, in the miracle of Lanciano, the host there. Human DNA was found in the tissue. White blood cells, red blood cells, hemoglobin, and microphages, indicating it was fresh blood. In the Tixla miracle, the blood on the surface had begun to coagulate, whereas the blood inside was still fresh, indicating that it was like a, like a bleeding wound, a continually bleeding wound. The flesh is human myocardium tissue of the left ventricle of an inflamed heart. And here's the most amazing thing, absolutely moving. In the miracle from Poland, There was evidence of trauma from the presence of thrombi indicating repeated lack of oxygen. Lesions that were present showed 
rapid cardiac spasms that are typical of someone in their death throes undergoing tremendous trauma and tremendous stress because it shows on the heart muscles. There are specific striations and lesions that appear on the heart of someone who's endured tremendous agonies, tremendous trauma and stress in their final death throes. It's the heart of our Lord. It's the heart of our Lord suffering in agony on the cross. We know that. We know that he underwent horrific agonies and trauma and stress on the cross for three hours until he expired. And that would have shown on the tissue of his heart. And that is exactly what is shown on the tissue of these miraculous preserved hosts that are flesh, the living flesh of our Lord. It is unexplained. Once again, you can't write this off. Scientists cannot explain it. This is what Dr. Sobanyets Lotowska said. He was one of the examining experts. Even NASA scientists who, who have at their disposal the most modern analytical techniques would not be able to artificially recreate such a thing. Dr. Frederick Zugibe, a forensic doctor from Columbia University who also examined one of the miracles, this was from Argent Argentina, he actually didn't know the source of the tissue. And when he found out, he was shocked. And not just shocked, tremendously moved. This is what he said. If white blood cells were present in the heart tissue, it is because at the moment you brought me the sample, it was pulsating. It was pulsating, meaning it was living. And to this day, it's still living. Living flesh, living blood. The consecrated hosts turned into the flesh and blood of our Lord. Miraculous proofs that God indeed is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. The greatest gift that God has left for his church on earth. And when we receive him in Holy Communion, in the state of grace, that's very important, in the state of grace, then it's a foretaste of our communion with him in heaven. It's a foretaste. And those who do receive him in the state of grace with true belief, you know what that is like. You know that it is a foretaste of heaven. They are the sweetest, purest moments of your life. And you know, in, the, in your heart of hearts, in the depths of your soul, you know that God is is there. He's uniting with you in a special way. And as he's uniting with you, he's healing you. He's forgiving you. He's cleansing you and purifying you. And he's strengthening you for the battle. But in those few moments, when he comes into your soul, your heart and soul, and unites himself with you, like I said, they are the sweetest moments on earth that cannot be described in human words. St. Therese of Lisieux, when she talked about her very first Holy Communion, the very first time she was able to receive the sacred host on her tongue into her body, she said she disappeared. She said, I was like a drop of water disappearing into the ocean of God's love. It was an unexplainable moment. And this is, like I said, it's, it's the greatest gift that God has left, the greatest mark of his love that he's left for his church on earth until we are reunited and united with him in the eternal realms, God willing, if we've lived a life according to his will in the state of grace. And so it's tremendously, it's heartbreaking to know that more than 75% of Catholics today do not believe that that truly is God in the flesh, 75%. And as I spoke of earlier, much of it, yeah, I, I will absolutely lay the blame, a lot of it, at the feet of our shepherds. Because you shepherds are the ones who set the example. And if you, yourself, do not treat the Holy Eucharist with the reverence, the due reverence and belief that our Lord deserves, then how on earth do you expect the flock to believe it? I have been to more masses than I can remember, than I can count, where the priest on the altar treated the Holy Eucharist like he was dealing with potato chips. I mean, just grabbing fistfuls of the consecrated host and just doling them out in bowls, just like this. And then when he's done, 
Oh, got to wipe off the crumbs. Oh, maybe do it on my cassock. Wipe it off. Like he's just dealing with a bunch of crackers, potato chips. I mean, it's, if that's how you treat our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, no wonder nobody believes. Come on, Father. Do you believe or do you not? And if you do believe, you would never handle our Lord that way, ever. Because you know that every single particle of the Holy Eucharist, every single tiny little particle, including those that are left on your hands, is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of God himself. This is why in the traditional Latin Mass, and and I don't want to get into the whole liturgy word here, I'm talking specifically about the handling of the Eucharist. In the traditional Latin Mass, after the priest consecrates, confects the Holy Eucharist, because he touches the Eucharist with these digits, he keeps them together like this for the rest of the Mass. He does not take them apart because he knows our Lord. I have pieces of our Lord here. And therefore, I will not touch anything with this until the ablutions, the cleansings, the proper cleansings. And when you see a priest treat the Holy Eucharist like that, there's reverence. The priest doesn't even have to say a word. You, you see it in the actions and the motions of the, of the way that they treat our Lord. Another thing is when you see priests genuflect before the altar, because genuflection is a sign and an acknowledgement. I am in the presence of my God, my Lord and my King. I'm in his presence. And when I pass the, the tabernacle where our Lord is inside, I kneel. I kneel, I genuflect as a sign of reverence, my Lord and my God. And the rule is that every time you pass before the tabernacle, you genuflect. And I'll tell you about two different experiences that I had, two contrasting experiences. One was at an FSSP parish in Indianapolis years and years ago. Uh, FSSP stands for the Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter, and they offer the traditional liturgy, the Latin Mass. And I was in the back of, you know, an empty church, and I was praying, and the priest was up on the altar taking care of some of the linens and various things. He didn't know that I was back there. He didn't know anybody was there. He thought it was a completely empty church. He was just going about his business, taking care of things. Every single time he passed before the Blessed Sacrament, before the tabernacle, he would genuflect reverently. Every time. Didn't matter. He must have passed by a dozen times because he was going from one side to the other. Every time without fail. He would reverently genuflect before the tabernacle. And to me, that communicated absolute belief. This priest believes. He's not doing it for show because he knows that he doesn't think anybody's here. He's doing it because he knows he's in the presence of the creator of the universe right there in the tabernacle who humbles himself out of love for us and hides himself under the form of bread and stays with us, stays with us. And so that to me was probably one, one of the most powerful uh, catechetical lessons ever. And he didn't say a word. I just saw him. That's it. He didn't say a word. Contrast that with another experience I had at, I didn't know at the time, but later on learned it was a very, very liberal parish. Once again, I'm in the back of the church because I used to, I think uh, this church was on my way to work. And so I would stop and, you know, go to daily mass, pray a little bit at the back of the church before I'd go on to work. And I was in the back of the church, dark, priest is up there, taking care of various things, and never once genuflected, never once gave an acknowledgement that our Lord was present in the tabernacle. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me now looking back on it because it was a very liberal left-leaning parish. And, and, and once you're, you know, if you're rejecting the basic teachings of the church, then why on earth wouldn't you also reject this basic dogma? of the real presence. Why would you continue to believe that? You know, at that point, your church has just become kind of a social, social justice sort of thing. It's not really about eternal matters and, and saving the soul. If so many Catholics have lost faith in the Holy Eucharist and the shepherds, you shepherds, you need to be looking at yourself and asking, what is it that I'm doing? What is it that I am doing? What is it that I can do to restore belief? in the Holy Eucharist, and it's not a $28 million Eucharistic crusade, crusade, which is what the U.S. bishops are planning on, $28 million Eucharistic crusade. Give me a break. 
give me a break. <laughs> when you've got bishops here saying, oh, let's just give communion to those in mortal sin. You know, let, let's, you know, wholesale sacrilege. Mortal sin, who, it doesn't matter. Let's ignore Canon 915. Give, holy, give communion to everybody. It doesn't matter. You could be pro-abortion. You could be living, you know, you could be divorced and married five times and, and living, you know, cohabitating. It doesn't matter. Come, come one, come all. Hand them out like potato chips because that's all they believe it is. And they're committing sacrilege. And now you want to put together a $28 million crusade? Exactly what is that going to accomplish? Really? Give me a break. You know what you need to do is start, start adoration at your parishes. That's a very simple thing to do. You know what? It's completely free. It doesn't take $28 million. Eucharistic adoration. All the parishes that conduct Eucharistic adoration, especially 24-hour Eucharistic adoration, they're the ones booming with vocations. They're the ones that are producing the new crop of seminarians and converts to the faith and baptisms. Why is that? Did it require some expensive campaign that cost millions of dollars and, you know, glossy, uh, whatever, promotional marketing stuff? No, no. There is a supernatural effect that takes place when you encounter our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, when you simply go there and kneel before him and pray to him in the silence and the depths of your soul. There is a supernatural occurrence there that, that we cannot explain. It's mysterious, but it's filled with grace, and it brings about grace, grace upon grace upon grace that nobody can explain, but that's what God does in response to our worship of him, our adoration of him. He ushers and he showers down blessings and graces. And I just wish more and more and more parishes would do that. And it was a real shame that during COVID, during the lockdowns, some people just shut down the adoration chapel. I know that they did that here. And it was terrible because there's, there's an adoration chapel here 24 hours that I remember I tried to stop by during COVID, the time when people needed him the most, our Eucharistic Lord. And yet they shut they shut that down. And I remember being terribly disappointed one day because I stopped by to say a few words to our Lord and the door was locked. It was locked. We've got to get out of this worldly mindset that we're in and start looking at the supernatural. Start placing that first. Start placing Christ, our focus on Christ first, starting with a renewal of our belief in our Eucharistic Lord, the real presence he has given us proof upon proof upon proof of this reality. These miracles, I encourage you, go and study them more because there are a lot more out there. This is only tip of the iceberg. There are a lot more out there. Please study it yourself. If you want to challenge it, you want to try to debunk it, disprove it, go do it. Please be my guest. Other scientists have tried to debunk them. They can't. It's unexplained. It is a miracle. And what is it a miracle of? God's love, ultimately. How profound that the flesh of the Eucharist is the heart of our Lord. The heart, the heart, his love. Again, you can contemplate this. You could spend eternity contemplating these things and you will never get to the bottom of this. How truly amazing and beautiful and and all pure, all good, and all loving, God is. We have to respond to his love. We have to do his will, obviously. But, but it's all there for us. All there. All there for you. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can write me at forward boldly at churchmilitant.com. I love to hear from you. And in the words of St. Joan of Arc, in God's name, forward boldly.